I know you're you're pretty articulate and able to uh, make concepts understandable, and you do a good job of uh, root cause essence. Uh, can you explain to the crowd how quantum computing is different than regular computing? And like one example, without having everybody's eyes go crossed and like multiple states yeah. at once and all this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, and let me say, in, in, a, in a couple of minutes, you can't explain quantum computing so people understand it. Right? It took me twenty years, but. I will say that quantum computers, it's, it's funny, everything in the world works on quantum, everything. Like, so if you go, if you go to, you know, we used to think that everything was what's called classical physics and it worked on gravity and atoms and stuff, but atoms and protons and neutrons are made of uh, smaller things called quantum and we call them quantum particles. If, if, once you get down to the so quarks and muons and stuff like that. So when you look at the very smallest parts of science, they really operate a whole lot differently, you know, like, like it's really strange, yep. like, if you, you know, in the classical world, if I go to throw a rock from here to there, I can tell, well, the rock's going to be here at the beginning and it's going to be there at the end. And I can actually compute math that tells me where the rock's going to be along the arc of the path and stuff. But in quantum, the answer for any particular problem is all possible pro or all possible answers. Like that rock could be over there at the start and be here at the end and everything in between called superposition. So what's interesting about that is it allows computers that work on uh, quantum particles, let me say everything works on quantum. So our regular traditional computers work on, you know, electrons. An electron is a, is a elementary particle, a quantum particle. And that's how CPUs work. CPUs would not work if we didn't have uh, electrons and quantum things working. The difference is that we're actually measuring the particles or the makeup of the electron and not measuring whole electrons. Like, so, you know, it, or be a photon, a piece of light, does it go right? Does it go left? That sort of stuff. But quantum computers are able to use these quantum particles, measure them kind of like bits and, you know, like bits, ones and zeros. But instead of being ones and zeros, it's one, zero, the answer would be one, zero and everything in between that's possible. So it really gives you, well, so we have things called qubits instead of bits, you get qubits. And the permutations and combinations of the storage and the computational power is such like you could fit all information about all things that have ever happened in the universe in something like 70 qubits. Yep. And we're probably in the next couple of years going to have many, many quantum computers with millions of qubits. And from my side as a computer security person, there is this race to see quantum computers will soon be sufficiently capable of breaking uh, a lot of modern day asymmetric encryption, uh, probably 90% of what we use to protect our internet and our banking. It's, you know, anything that has TLS on it or what people call S mistakenly call SSL. So to this day, it's the stuff that protects your bank cards. It's the, it's the stuff that makes your Wi-Fi routers work. The cell phones work. What's called asymmetric encryption, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, Elgamal, that sort of stuff. Well, sufficiently capable quantum computers are in the works right now, very rudimentary computers, but the entire world is spending tens of billions of dollars to get to these computers that are sufficiently capable. And let me say that today, nation states like America, like China, like Russia, are literally eavesdropping on people's communications and storing them in large secret clouds so that in the future, when they have these sufficiently capable quantum computers, they can use that computational power and superposition to crack those secrets. So that's coming. And in the process. Oh, uh, really? That's interesting. So they're storing all this for like, kind of like for future reference. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Ask yourself, how long does your organization need to keep it secret secret? Right. You know, and you yeah. could, you know, if you're in certainly in the nation state adversary field, they could be recording your conversations, but you know, and, and let me say, what's the outside of when we're going to be able to do this? I think on the outside, 10 years would be really far down. We think it's going to be a lot closer than 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think it's going to be within five years. I even give 10% chance to it's actually already been done by the United States or Russia or China. And we just don't know. Let me say United States or China. Russia is not right. that big of a player in it. But right. that we, so they're actually already cracking secrets and we just don't know about it. I give a 10% chance of that being the reality because the governments are always, anytime they come with new stuff, they, they don't let us know. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like McGill Air Force Base down here. They said they have the air show this year, but they're not going to have it for a few years because they got to redo the land, the, 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 the 
the area or something. It's like, eh, it seems a little fishy to me. 